further ado on um, today's Lunch and Learn is Resisting Achievement Culture with Slow Librarianship, and it's sponsored by ESLN. And I'm just going to introduce our lovely speaker, Meredith. So, Meredith Farkas is a faculty librarian at Portland Community College and past president of AC, uh, ACRL Oregon. She writes the monthly column in practice for American libraries and the blog Information Wants to Be Free. Meredith was honored in 2009 with the LITA slash Library High Tech Award for Outstanding Communication in Library and Information Technology, and in 2014 with the ACRL Instruction Section Innovation Award. I'm going to hand this over to Meredith now. Great. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for being here today. I really wish we could all be together in New York right now, but I'm coming to you from rainy and gray Portland, Oregon. What a time to be giving a talk, right? <laughs> I hope it's a um, welcome distraction for all of us. I will admit that based on the world we're kind of living in now, I've made some tweaks to what I plan to cover, though the focus is still on resisting achievement culture. Um, also, there's a link to my slides in um, by the session description in Feedloop, so you can access them later. And at the end of the session, you'll see um, a bibliography of things that I've read or, or watched that really inspired me for this talk. Um, I'm planning to take questions and comments at the end of the presentation, but Please feel free to ask them in the chat as we go and um, yeah, cover them at the end. So I had been asked to give this talk well before our world was shaken um, to its core by COVID-19, but the issues I wanted to discuss have I think been thrown into even more stark relief since. The COVID-19 pandemic has revealed just so much about our society, even for the most privileged and fortunate of us who still have jobs and can do them safely. It's shown us how the life that we felt so secure about turns out to have been basically built atop a Jenga set and removing a single piece sends the whole thing toppling. And the support that you assume you're going to get from society just isn't there. There's no real safety net. And that, you know, rugged individualism that our country has been so proud of turns out to just have been rebranded selfishness. It's really disconcerting to realize that many of our fellow humans have very little commitment to the greater good or even care about those less privileged than them. And I think the most frustrating part is recognizing that this is how the system was designed to work. It's not a bug, it's really a feature. In a culture that is so focused on individual achievement, that's focused on people constantly proving their worth, on collecting accolades, in a culture that really reifies hustle and that good old um, Horatio Alger story of, you know, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. You know, everything you do is really a referendum on your worth. We live in a phony meritocracy. Success is seen as self-created, even when a person starts off life at third base with all the resources and connections one could hope for. And anything other than success is a sign of personal weakness or deficiency, even when it's caused by things completely beyond our control. We have a safety net, or why would we have a safety net when society is predicated on the assumption that anyone can be successful if they just work hard enough? And if you're not a success, well, clearly that must be your fault. For those of us who bought into the idea that success and fulfillment was within our reach if we only worked hard enough and proved ourselves enough, the reward for our grinding and struggling is often burnout, as we see in this quote from Maris Kreitzman, who's um, worked in the publishing field as both a salaried employee and a freelancer. Where does ambition go when jobs disappear and the things you've been striving for barely even exist anymore? And what if the things for which you've been striving no longer feel important because they're the spoils of a rotten system that needs a complete overhaul? 
I still want to create and get paid for it, but our opportunities seem to be narrowing, the world becoming a little smaller each time. The scope of our ambitions must be downsized over and over again. It only took a few years of working in an office to realize that the idea of meritocracy is a lie, and the only thing hard work guarantees is unpaid overtime, not success. And our profession, just like hers, is built on the same broken foundation. What I hope to talk about today is the insidious ways that achievement culture shows up and shapes our work and our sense of self and to propose an alternative. And that alternative is slow librarianship. First, I just wanted to start by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I've been a librarian at Portland Community College for over six years. And prior to that, I was the head of library instruction at a large public urban research university, and before that at a small rural private college. I've been um, writing my column for American Libraries Magazine since 2008 and my blog um, since 2004. And having grown up in New Jersey in the 80s, I am an eternal optimist when it comes to rooting for the Mets. So suck it all you Yankees fans. I've been so lucky in my career to work with really terrific people who saw something in me and gave me opportunities to lead and teach and shine. And through that work, I've received probably more individual recognition than anyone really deserves. And while my CV may make it look like, you know, I have it all together, internally, I'm the same messy, broken person I've always been. I've, um, the trauma, anxiety, and depression that I've had since childhood have left me forever searching for external validation that I feel like I need to feel worthy. And I've never found it, not through any of those accomplishments. It's only in the past year or so that I've really accepted that the migraines that I've sometimes gotten up to 15 days per month are like an actual disability and not something I should just muscle through. I'm also a work addict, which is also something I've only recently come to terms with. Um, for so long, I saw that as just being a good work ethic, what I should be doing. And, you know, I received a lot of positive recognition for my work ethic, which really only fuels that addiction. The host of the Harvard Business Review podcast, The Anxious Overachiever, um, said in one episode that work addiction is a socially acceptable addiction. You get a lot of reward and external validation. And I think that can lull people into a sense that, what, that you're doing the right thing when you're killing yourself with work to really just avoid dealing with the pain that the addiction's masking. And I think work addiction and the encouragement of work addiction is very much fostered and encouraged by achievement culture. So what is achievement culture? Um, I think it has many definitions, but in the workplace you see it as an organizational culture that is really focused on wins and accolades and achievements that are really visible to external stakeholders. It's also focused very much on maximizing worker productivity. Since the you know, dawn of the Industrial Revolution, the most common way that um, people have measured organizational success is through productivity. And it's long been believed that being more productive will make people and organizations more successful, um, that most of us don't even question that anymore. And productivity is a big business with books and systems and apps and tools all focused on making sure you are using every single minute to its greatest purpose. And productivity gets into the personal sphere um, where achievement culture is focused on self-optimization and becoming the very best version of yourself. Often, of course, based on external norms rather than your own um, inherent measures of success. And all of this is predicated on the myth of the meritocracy that comes with that good old, you know, Protestant work ethic and the spirit of capitalism. Achievement culture is a culture of more. We should always be doing more, achieving more. Let's add new services and programs without letting go of any of the existing things we do. Budget cuts? Hey, we can do more with less, right? 
we certainly won't cut our hours and services when we start losing staff. Just as our environment is degrading as a result of the ever increasing use of its natural resources, we have limited resources. I remember um, in the first academic library I worked in, uh, my boss asked me to put in my annual goals that I would increase library instruction by 25%. And I actually achieved it that year um, through a lot of sweat um, and tears. But she then wanted it in for the following year's goals as well, which would not only have strained our teaching capacity, but probably wasn't even achievable. And the focus on growth can also miss the point. At the time, my colleagues and I were really wanting to focus on the quality of our teaching rather than the quantity, because what's the point of teaching more if students aren't getting anything out of it? But demonstrating growth to the powers that be was seen as the be all end all, um, even when it wasn't the most valuable thing we could do. And there's the rub. While achievement culture may sound like a good thing, something to foster, in organizations, it can focus, it can lead to focus on visible success and innovation over real mission-driven success. It can lead to chasing after the next hot thing rather than doing what's best for your community. It can lead to focusing on the things that are easy to measure or that will look good to funders and other external audiences. And a focus on achievement culture can really create toxic cultures of one-upsmanship where the focus becomes much more on being innovative than best meeting the needs of the people they're trying to serve. I was really inspired by Julia Glassman's 2017 article, The Innovation Fetish and Slow Librarianship, where she talked about how achievement culture has led to a virtual arms race amongst her and her colleagues. Since the members of each year's peer review cohort are judged against each other, and it's been made clear that only a select few can ever earn the coveted marker of exceptional performance, the process has become an arms race of the biggest, most impressive accomplishments librarians can showcase. How do you play up the fact that you're a talented and beloved teacher when you have a colleague who's just overhauled the entire information literacy curriculum for their subject area and deployed a brand new series of online instructional modules? Sure, that approach may not have been appropriate for the departments with which you liaise, but think about how these two stories look side by side. There is intense pressure to constantly innovate, to throw out the old and invent something new. And for those of us who've accepted the idea of meritocracy and fully embraced achievement culture in our work, we frequently find that as we rack up achievements, we don't actually find our life or our perspectives improving in any real way. Long before he ran for president, Andrew Yang wrote this terrific piece on achievement culture. In his book, Excellent Sheep, William Duresowitz describes the current generation of strivers as driven to achieve without knowing why. And then they become paralyzed when they're not sure how to proceed. I jokingly call the hangups associated with the drive to achieve as the achievement demons. When I was growing up, I'd study for days trying to get good grades. When I'd get an A, I'd feel elation for about 30 seconds, and then a feeling of emptiness, rinse and repeat. Research has shown time and again that the reward for high achievers at work is usually more work. <laughs> it's a never ending treadmill of striving. So why do we keep running on the achievement culture treadmill when we never reach that place where we feel good or satisfied or enough? because of persistent messages in our culture that we're not enough. I think it's particularly salient for women and those of us who, are, who have experienced trauma or oppression, but our whole economy is designed around convincing people that they're not good enough as they are, that they need to be more of this, less of that, that they're not doing enough in every part of their lives. And social media is just one big anxiety, low self-esteem and FOMO engine. And along with these persistent messages about our worth is the promise that if we do more, achieve more, buy more, we'll somehow be made whole. So you can't enjoy the present because you're always striving towards another goal and you believe that once you reach that thing, everything's gonna be better. But after that, there's another project and another goal and another, 
and another, the goalposts keep moving. But you keep running on that treadmill, believing that a time will come when you'll feel whole and fulfilled. But if you're looking for fulfillment through external validation, you are never going to find it. And yet your job and perhaps others in your life will happily capitalize on your never ending need to please. It's good to remember that there are a lot of people out there who benefit from you thinking you're not enough. Achievement culture is a tool that capitalism uses to keep workers striving and constantly competing against one another rather than looking for the man behind the curtain. As Carl Honoré rightly says here, it begins to feel like we're serving the economy while the economy really only serves the super rich workers in helping professions like our own try to enough that we don't care enough about our patrons, we're positioned as selfish. And that's a big part of the idea of vocational awe. Vocational awe is a term coined by Fobazi Attar, which positions the profession as a calling and the institution as a sacred beacon of democracy. And that works to both position the library as an institution that's beyond critique which prevents recognition of harm, and also positions those working in the profession who put their well being first as monsters who aren't devoted enough to the calling. While this term was coined by a librarian, it shows up in all helping professions like social work, teaching, nursing, and more. Having been a social worker in my previous career, I definitely saw the same dynamics at play. There was no limit to how much you could martyr yourself for your job. Another piece of the you are not enough puzzle is the focus on self-optimization. Companies, social media, and self-help books are selling the idea that you can be better in every single part of your life. You can be a more productive worker. You can be a better spouse, parent, partner, friend. You could work out more. You could eat better. You could have a more beautiful home. You could turn your hobbies into paying gigs. You could use every minute of every day more effectively. How dare any of us waste a moment of our precious time? But all this really begs the question, why? To what end are we forever optimizing our lives? We're not computers. We're not machines. We're people. The point of life isn't to use every single moment to its fullest. When people feel like they're wasting their time or not living their best life, they can't enjoy the life they have. But it's big business because people spend a lot of money trying to make themselves and their lives look more like the outward norms of success that they see. I've already described some of the personal consequences of achievement culture. Um, but here's some of the impacts it can have in the workplace. As you can imagine, the achievement culture that Julia Glassman described creates an environment of competition, which then decreases the incentives for colleagues to work together. Relationships, whether at work or within the larger community, become focused on meeting goals rather than a goal in and of itself. Transactional relationships are rarely relationships that result in learning growth, or true connection. Alma Ortega's dissertation on academic libraries and toxic leadership shows that bullying, neglect, and other characteristics of toxic leadership are endemic in libraries. And if you haven't listened to a talk by Katrina Davis Kendrick, where she shares the results of her research on low morale in libraries, it is very much worth finding one on YouTube. She's amazing. The workplace abuse and neglect that she's documented in her research is so disturbing. And her work with Ione Damasco um, also demonstrates that BIPOC librarians experience abuse and neglect at much greater rates than white librarians and, and with much greater severity. If you read Tima Oaken's description of how white supremacy shows up in um, the workplace, it clearly shows that white supremacy culture is toxic for most of us. 
elements like perfectionism, power hoarding, paternalism, and fear of open conflict keep all workers from feeling safe showing up as their authentic selves. A focus on innovation and achievement can also lead to inequity in how we serve our patrons. Chasing the shiny thing that will get attention often keeps people from the less sexy work that's critical to serving our most vulnerable populations. We also can see how this focus on individual achievement, competition, and meritocracy can lead to overwork and work addiction. Researchers have suggested that the growth of achievement culture has led to significant increases in depression um, amongst, and anxiety amongst teens and children. And Katrina Davis Kendrick's research also has shown significant mental and physical health impacts of toxic work environments. Could the slow movement be the antidote to this toxic achievement culture? That's what I'm hoping to explore here. But first I wanted to start by looking at the history of the slow movement. The slow movement started with slow food. The slow food movement was a response to the impact of globalization on food and food culture. And it came to prominence when members protested the opening of a McDonald's at the Spanish Steps in Rome. While it started in Italy, it became an international movement focused on enjoying food, appreciating terroir and local food culture, and ethically sourcing food. Here are the main tenets of the slow food movement, good, clean, and fair. I'm not going to read this through right now, but they relate mainly to justice, sustainability, quality, and pleasure. Terrific values to live by. Can you imagine similar tenets for librarianship? The Slow Food Manifesto clearly spoke to a lot of people. The idea of slow has now been adopted in areas as diverse as parenting, medicine, urban design, religion, teaching, and more. There have also been a slew of recent books that have sort of challenged the American focus on productivity and self-optimization. I've read the first two here and How to Do Nothing and Do Nothing really pushed me to question a lot of assumptions that I had long accepted as fact. I really appreciate that we're starting to question these sacred cows of our capitalist society that really aren't serving most of us. I'd read about slow in other contexts, but it wasn't until I read Julia Glassman's article in 2017 that I got really excited about the idea of applying slow to our profession. And it wasn't until my own personal revelations in the past few years that I really started to explore what it might look like in our field. In her article, um, Julia explicitly did decline to describe what slow librarianship might look like in our profession, focusing more on defining the problems that necessitate a change. But I think the last sentence um, really gives us a clue about what she was thinking. Perhaps if we reject the capitalist drive to constantly churn out new products and instead take a stand to support more reflective and responsive practices, we can offer our patrons services that are deeper more lasting, and more human. So based on that, and on my own readings and reflections, here's my attempt at defining what slow librarianship might look like. This isn't the be-all, end-all definition, and I hope it will spawn conversations about what slow librarianship might look like in your library or how it might impact your own orientation towards work. Like the definition of the slow food movement broken up into good, clean, and fair, I broke the characteristics up into three categories, good, humane, and thoughtful. And each has a list of characteristics related to that. I think for a library to be good, we first have to recognize where we've fallen short in the past and where we fall short now. Librarians who embrace slow will also embrace critical practice. 
instead of taking things as truth because they've been that way forever, we're going to question the assumptions and power structures that lie beneath them. Just like how many are now seeing that vocational awe represents a power structure designed to remove our ability to self-advocate and self-care, there are so many norms, assumptions, and power structures that harm our patrons, our colleagues, and our ability to support our patrons. Fines, for example, they seem okay on the surface because they're theoretically applied equally to everyone. But in reality, we know that fines are unequally applied and disproportionately harm poor families and people of color and often prevent these populations from using the library. Also related to vocational awe, I think we have to acknowledge the harm libraries have caused to marginalized communities and individuals. We can't improve unless we can really recognize that libraries have not always actually been good for everyone. And the next step, once we we can see behind the veil, is to disconnect, create inequities. An anti-racist library doesn't just mean hiring BIPOC library workers or doing an equity audit. Important. It also means how white supremacy culture operates. I mentioned this before, and it's in my bibliography at the end of my slides, but Tima Oaken's white supremacy culture document can be a great starting off point for organizations looking to dismantle white supremacy culture in their organizations. There are so many books, book chapters, articles, and social media stories from BIPOC library workers who felt oppressed, excluded, bullied, and microaggressed against. I've known fantastic BIPOC librarians who've left the profession because of how they were treated at their places of work. That's not only unconscionable, but it's a huge loss to the profession. We can all do better. A good way to, focus, to avoid focusing on innovation and visible wins is to ensure that your organization is led by its mission and values. If your library doesn't already have a value statement, this is a good time to work on one with your colleagues. Connecting around values can help staff really see what they're working for, which at times like this is so needed. I know when I'm feeling burnt out, connecting with my why can help remind me of why I became a librarian and why I love what I do. When the library is doing strategic planning or annual goal setting, staff should weigh priorities based on how in line they are with the library's values. They should also deeply weigh priorities based on a hopefully deep knowledge of the needs of their community. Libraries can sometimes focus mainly on meeting the needs of the most vocal patrons, who those who have the most privilege. Libraries are not equitably serving their community if they are not laser focused on their most oppressed and needy community members. We should be judged by how we engage and serve those members. In the academic space, I've seen libraries embrace trends that not only are not in line with library values, but also don't serve students equitably. Learning analytics is a major trend in higher education but one that doesn't really jive with the library's focus on patron privacy. And yet some libraries are collecting transaction level student data in order to demonstrate the value of the library to college or university administrators. I've also seen learning analytics data and the next step, predictive analytics, used in ways that actually harm marginalized students. At my college, we discovered that the criteria for student emergency grants, which was built on a predictive model of student success, was actually excluding most of our most vulnerable students. Predictive analytics can create the very inequities they're supposed to be addressing. Maybe learning analytics is the future and we just need to get on board. But if we do, it should absolutely be in ways that don't compromise our values and that are purpose built to support our most vulnerable students. Never 
Has the need for human and humane organizations been more apparent than during this pandemic? No matter what our living situation or privilege, this year has been traumatic. And the idea that work can just be business as usual is patently absurd. I'm so inspired by organizations where leaders have really recognized this and are supporting their staff as whole people through the crisis. And I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize those organizations that have treated their workers like widgets, putting them in harm's way, laying them off in the absence of budget cuts. It's unconscionable. All library workers deserve better than that. What did communication at your job look like when the pandemic struck? Did, ad did administrators check in with how people were coping? Did they tell staff that they didn't expect you to get as much done and to focus on yourself and your family? A people first organization is one that cares about its people as people. You are more than what you contribute to your workplace. A good supervisor cares about your well being. A humane library would create an environment where all staff feel a sense of psychological safety where they can be their whole selves at work. They don't have to hide parts of themselves, the fact that they're a parent, the fact that they have a chronic illness, their culture, they feel safe speaking freely. People in humane organizations also feel supported in setting boundaries that maximize their well being. They don't feel pressured to stay late at work because the boss does or answer emails on weekends. And I think it takes proactive communication from supervisors to create such an environment. My boss is a super nice person, but in the spring, she didn't say anything to those of us with young kids about putting them first or that it was okay to get not get all our work done because we were also homeschooling little people. There was just benevolent silence. And while I think she probably would have been supported had I asked for help, I felt shame. And instead of taking the time I needed to support my son, I put work first. You know, old habits die hard. <laughs> this fall, um, I'm near the end of taking leave to focus on my son's schooling and well being because I just didn't feel like I had that explicit support to know. I could put him first and work. And even having policies isn't enough. Research shows that most women in academia don't stop the tenure clock when they have kids because they worry it will be held against them. And sometimes it is held against them. These things need to be explicitly communicated to employees and supported because only those who feel truly psychologically safe in the organization will feel safe making those boundaries themselves. And those are usually the people with the most privilege. The obsession with productivity and producing is so incredibly short-sighted. The cult of productivity promotes the idea that time is wasted when we're not working efficiently towards a goal and that we're failures if we can't do more with less. But we all know that there's value in not spending every single moment moving the needle forward on projects. The time I spend talking to a colleague may not look like work, but it's often building capacity for collaboration, knowledge sharing, decreasing stress, or just leading to a better work culture. Time spent visiting community groups or at community meetings might not be directly related to a specific project, but they probably result in learning more about your community and how to serve it better. They may even lead to partnership opportunities. The more our relationships with colleagues and others in the community are transactional, the less likely they'll be to bear valuable fruit. Some of my best instructional collaborations with faculty in my liaison areas grew out of my just being around or from my attempts to build relationships without a specific goal in mind. But also, Spending time not working towards a specific goal all the time is critical to our creativity and ultimately our productivity. I know when I feel like I have too much on my plate, my ability to do anything decreases. It's like an overloaded computer where everything just slows down. 
and research has borne that out. So giving employees space and time is actually better for the bottom line. And people absolutely need fallow time and time talking to others to be creative. I have felt profoundly less creative over the past few years. And I think a big part of that has been because I haven't had funding to attend conferences where I can recharge and talk to people outside of my organization. The cult of productivity really speaks to the need we have to feel busy and therefore worthwhile. In America, being busy has become a status symbol. If you're busy, you have to be important. It's a way to cover up our existential worries and dread, but ultimately it's not helpful. In Julia Glassman's article about innovation and slow librarianship, she talked about that arms race at her place of work to be the most innovative and thus earn that exceptional, exceptional performance designation on their review. It was a great example of how our current reward systems are designed to reward individual genius rather than the teamwork that's needed to make most great projects happen. The current reward systems, both within libraries and in our library organizations, provide incentives for people not to work in teams, or if they're in teams, to focus on making sure that they stand out. We know that most big things in libraries are not done by a single person, yet most awards are designed to recognize an individual. We need to change our recognition and reward systems to reward being a great team member, those who help others to shine. This will help prevent toxic cultures where people feel in constant competition with each other. What would a thoughtful, contemplative organization look like? The more I've purposely tried to slow down in my work, the more I've thought about what it would look be like to work in an organization that actually valued slowing down. I think first and foremost, we wouldn't get caught up in the shiny things. I used to have a boss who would come back from conferences with like a list of things she saw other libraries doing that she thought we should replicate. And they were always like innovative, cool things that probably would have actually been fun to implement, but they weren't actually things that would be valuable for our user populations. And that gets back to tying our goals to our values and patrons' needs. Sometimes it's also about just going with the simple solution. Sometimes the simplest solution, even if it's not fancy or sexy or elegant, is the best one. Last year, I built interactive tutorials using Google Forms to replicate the kind of teaching we do in the classroom. Google Forms isn't elegant or slick like expensive tutorial software, um, but it was free and it was a good fit for our context. Sometimes good enough is good enough. When I'm working with others on a project, sometimes I find that a good process is actually more important than the product itself. If we take our time and value team building and collaborative learning, we can actually get quite a lot out of the process. I've led my library's um, annual instructional assessment program for the past few years, and I've learned more from trial and error and from collaborating with my colleagues than I actually learned from the assessments itself themselves. It's led every year to a better assessment product. You'll never get those benefits if you're focused solely on getting everything done in the quickest time possible. I think it also speaks to my next point about um, a learning culture. I think a learning culture is one where workers want to know more about patrons' needs and how they use the library, where workers are given time and funding to learn, and where the organization comes together to really learn and reflect as a, as a group. I think time is one of the most important pieces of this. We simply can't learn and grow if we're too busy to reflect on what we're doing. A few years ago, I started intentionally making time to write out a few reflections on classes I taught after I taught them. Well, I used to believe that after teaching a class, I would remember what I wanted to remember for the next time I taught it. It was usually a blur because 
I'd worked with so many other classes by that point. Taking the time to really think about what went well, what didn't, and writing it down really helped me to improve my teaching. Without that time, I'd probably make it, be making the same mistakes over and over again. I talked about how our current recognition and reward systems are designed to recognize the individual, but also our field is surprisingly stingy with recognition of any kind. And all that does is create a scarcity and competition mentality that can turn organizations toxic. Recognition is one of the few resources we have that is endlessly renewable. People don't necessarily need money or a plaque or a medal. Sometimes just calling out their contributions in a meeting or sending them an appreciative email can make all the difference. And when you feel appreciated, your motivation increases hugely. I read Adam Grant's terrific book, Give and Take, a while back, and I was inspired to start being the change I wanted to see. I began writing thank you cards to my colleagues who I really appreciated, telling them what I appreciate about them. It only required a minimal amount of effort, but the impact was huge. The colleagues I sent cards to felt great. It often led to meaningful conversations, and I felt great about doing it. It also put me in a frame of mind for looking for the good that my colleagues did rather than looking for things they did wrong. I truly believe that a culture of appreciation and gratitude can lead to a huge shift in people's mindsets for the better. I know some of you are probably thinking, that sounds lovely, but my library's culture is nothing like this, and it's not within my sphere of influence to change it. I also have a pretty limited ability to create change at my place of work, but I can change my own mindset and how I operate within the culture, which might create small shifts over time. So I wanna focus the end of this presentation on what we can do as individuals to move towards slow librarianship. Here are some things that I've done or that I'm trying to do. I already mentioned the reflecting I do on my teaching, but I also keep a journal at home where I jot down three things about my day that I'm grateful for. It doesn't take more than a minute or two, but it's a great way to end my day with a focus on the good. It's really done wonders for my mindset. Becoming more mindful is also tremendously valuable. Mindfulness doesn't have to mean meditation, though I did start a meditation practice almost two years ago. In fact, I think the most important thing I've gotten out of my mindfulness practice is just a habit of slowing down and really focusing on how I feel in the moment instead of just reacting. Before, I often felt held hostage by my anxiety, but now I've learned to sit with my discomfort and really consider what's causing it. Mindfulness is about paying attention. It's incredible how much of our lives we spend on autopilot and reacting rather than really paying attention to what's going on. Mindfulness has helped me spend less time blaming myself as I began to see the external things that the external things that were impacting my well-being. The book Radical Compassion by Tara Brock, which is also um, listed in my bibliography, it really helped me to slow down, try to understand my feelings, and practice some very needed self-compassion. It's helped me to feel more in control of how I feel. And I love um, this quote from Jenny O'Dell in her book, um, How to Do Nothing, about the importance of mastering our attention. She said, I'm personally unsatisfied with untrained attention, which flickers from one new thing to the next, not only because it's a shallow experience, or because it's an expression of habit rather than will, but because it gives me less access to my own human experience. I talked about how I tried to create a culture of gratitude at my job through thank you notes, but there's so many ways a culture of gratitude could take shape. Please consider how you and others at your place of work might foster a culture of appreciation and recognition I was recently listening to the wonderful podcast, Everything Happens, when the host, um, who's a professor at Duke Divinity School, who's living with stage four cancer, asked, 
Am I built from the outside in or am I built from the inside out? I found that question amazingly provocative. How many of us have our versions of success based on external measures or based on a desire for external validation? I used to be on the path toward becoming a library director. I was climbing the ladder and I realized it wasn't actually what I wanted to do. A big part of finding your own path is not comparing yourself to others. It's poison. And as my situation shows, you can be achieving all over the place in all the ways that are traditionally valued and still not feel that great. The next one's really aspirational for me. Um, I'm really bad at asking for what I need at work or anywhere. <laughs> um, it's, but we need to feel safe asking for what we need at work to be successful. We need to be able to set boundaries that nurture our well-being. I've also gotten a lot better at saying no, and I'm slowly, very, very slowly learning that I can pick my battles. Sometimes I just need to step back and not get involved in things that I know will leave me depleted. Finally, it's worth thinking about how you can slow down and talking to others. It's in those moments that we become more creative and energized for the work. Um, they are absolutely not wastes of time, but essential to doing your best work. You don't need to be doing all the things to be enough. Here's some questions to reflect on as you think of building a culture of slow librarianship in your life and your workplace. I don't feel like I really have time to get into the questions right now, but I think they're really good ones to consider as you consider how you could be living a life where you feel more fulfilled. So many of us have little control over the culture of our workplaces, but that doesn't mean we can't move the needle on these things. We don't have to give in to the prevailing culture. We don't have to give in to despair. We have to decide who we want to be and how we can model that in our work. Sometimes we have to resist the dominant culture. Sometimes we have to say no. I pick my battles better now, but I've also determined what my most strongly held values are. And I let those guide me. And I stay in the fight and I resist things that are antithetical to my values. I truly believe that modeling slow librarianship in our own behavior can create small change in our culture. And it just feels good to live our values rather than giving in to toxicity. It only takes one step forward to start moving in the right direction. Thank you so much for listening. I'd be happy to hear your thoughts on achievement culture or take any questions that you have. Hi all. Um, wow, that was an amazing talk. We actually have a few questions already. Um, so one of the questions is, let me scroll up here. Okay, so Elizabeth from Fernandesia Library Association, hopefully I said that correctly. Um, where can we find more of your work? Oh, um, well, I've written a lot on this topic on my blog. Um, last not last summer, but the summer before, um, I guess nine, 2019, I wrote this whole series of like thoughts at mid-career. And that was really sort of what seeded this talk and actually was what um, made, made uh, Jessica, um, who invited me to give this talk, ask me to do it. Um, so that would be a great spot. Um, yeah, also my column in American Libraries, I've written a lot about topics like this, um, you know, white supremacy culture and um, resilient, you know, the idea of resilience and about um, reflecting. So yeah, um, if you go to American Libraries website, you'll see all of my old columns there. So there's hopefully some good nuggets. Awesome. Um, another question that we have is, um, would you be able to go back to the slide about the questions for yourself, for Jesse? 
Oh, sure. Yeah, I can stay on that right now. And remember, these these um, these slides are available if you go um, in, if you look to my um, the description of this session, you'll see at the bottom that there's a link to my slides. So these are things you can totally um, check out later as well. And I have a really long bibliography at the end with lots of great stuff to read that was really formative in, um, in shaping my thinking. And speaking of the bibliography, so that is inside the presentation slides that you can get attached to the feed loop. Okay, someone yeah. has the bibliography specifically. Yeah, so right after um, that last slide for questions, you, there's like a four page <laughs> bibliography, not, not a very, um, I'd probably get a bad grade if I were a college student. I was just looking at this morning, I'm like, oh my God, my formatting isn't even, you know, consistent, but <laughs> it, you'll be able to find the stuff at least. <laughs> um, and also Lucien, um, so the slides are, when you look at the description in the, well, your feed loop, look at the description, you'll see support links. And then that's, it says Google Slides, click that. And that's how you get the slide deck. Exactly. Um, is there any other questions? I'm looking at the chat. You can also raise your hand um, when you click on participants in the video and then you'll see raise hand. We have, we have room for like maybe one or two more questions if anyone has any. And comments are great too. If you have thoughts yeah. on this, like, yeah, not a bad thing. So Tony from Port Washington Public Library says, having spent the good part of my pre-library life in sales, the heart of achievement culture, we are fortunate to work in a field where our income is not in direct proportion with how overdriven we force ourselves to be. It's a good yeah. comment. That's very true. And my husband um, grew up in, in the Port Washington area, so mm -hmm. shout out. <laughs> And everyone so far, just so you know, Meredith, has loved your presentation and so that this was phenomenal and inspiring. So. Oh, that's so kind. Um, yeah, I mean, I took so much of this stuff for granted for so many years in my career and just drove myself to exhaustion. And once I started asking why I was doing these things and what was behind them, I think it really, it really changed the way I operated and I live a much happier life now. Also, another good comment I saw pop in, uh, Genevieve from Buffalo and Erie County Bu Public Library says, this speaks to just who I am, a perfectionist and overachiever, but I often freeze and don't accomplish what I want want to because I get overwhelmed by the end result needing to be perfect. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, that is, <laughs> that is such a librarian thing, right? We're all, yeah, it took me a long time to get to a place where like, okay, if I create a tutorial that gets at the learning outcomes that students need, but isn't pretty or sexy or really what I'd ideally wanted. And that's basically what I spent spring term doing when we suddenly moved to doing everything online. Like, it's okay. <laughs> oh, amazing. Um, let's see. Oh, Emily Dowie from Pearl River Public Library says, I really appreciate how you spoke how once you achieve something, you're not even happy, you just feel empty. And that's how I feel too. Yeah. Yeah, it's so, it's so tempting when you're working on a project to think, oh, when this is done, I'm going to feel good, right? But then there's always, there's always going to be something else, um, always. It's so hard. Oh, and this is one other sweet comment. I'm just going to keep on reading comments here. <laughs> um, Anita from Ram Ramapo Caskill Library System. Congratulations, Meredith, on having found some balance for yourself. I hope we all reach that point for our individual selves. So the support we feel during these conferences is something we need to hold on to eternally. Oh, that's really nice. And yay, Catskills. That's where my grandparents <laughs> Old home week here. Oh, um, so Jocelyn Walder from Gilderlin Public Library. Um, can you share your blog address again? Oh, sure. 
it let me get to that Ooh, last, last slide, slide right? I think it's there yeah there you go oh and thank you jessica for putting it in the chat um <gasps> oh, we, we also have a question from lucianne from queen's public library how do you deal well, Oops. How do you deal with others who try to dim your shine? Oh, and that is so real. I mean, I, I, in this competitive environment, I used to like really let that affect me. And now I've really started thinking about how when people are doing that, it's really a product of the culture. I don't blame them. We've, we are in a culture that has created this like only one person can shine at a time, only one person can can achieve. And it creates, you know, it pits workers against each other instead of us realizing that, you know, it's just driving. Oh, you froze for a second, Meredith. Thing us to achieve and achieve and if we're hurt about that and not let it bother me. Oh. Did I have internet problems there? Were you yeah, able to it hear that? a little bit midway. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, okay. I mean, I just, it's the system, not the, hate the game, not the player, I guess. Um, we have room for one more question and then we'll let Meredith go. Anyone have any? Um, also, Jennifer Russell. Oh. Okay. Oh, Jennifer Russell says she appreciated the quote about working hard, then being happy for a short time, then the feeling, feeling fades quickly. And it took me a while. Like I had read that a long time ago. And then like, I'm like, oh wait, Andrew Yang, like that Andrew Yang. Oh, <laughs> clearly he has not stopped um, um, it, believing in achievement culture <laughs> his year. Well, I'm going to close up the questions and comments. Oh, wait, let's agree. Oh, yes, um, Jocelyn, um, the presentation is being recorded. It'll be available at a later date. But just so you know, everyone who's listening here, you do have access to this platform until end of December for all the pre-recorded stuff. So it'll be uploaded at some point after the conference. All right. Thanks everyone for well, coming. Thank you. A lot of other things to take away your attention right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. I'm going to close this out. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Meredith. Bye. Bye.